Good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tom Dunn. I am the Division I Chair, my partner at uh, Pierce Atwood in, in New England. And thank you for attending our last Toolbox Talk Series uh, program of uh, 2022. Uh, this is a topic that's near and dear to many of our hearts, uh, prevailing party attorney's fees um, clauses, uh, how to obtain them, how to defend against them. And we have two fabulous uh, discussion group leaders, Catherine Delory and Mark Johnson. Uh, Catherine Delory, as many of you, if not all of you know, uh, is a longtime uh, steering committee member for Division I. She's senior counsel at Gordon and Reese, um, based out of the San Francisco office. Um, and Mark Johnson uh, is a partner at Atlantic and Hannah. Uh, he has over 30 years of legal experiences in construction uh, and environmental litigation, tried 40 cases to decision or verdict, including seven in the last two years, um, which is a pretty impressive feat, Mark, that you were able to do that during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, they have done an excellent job getting ready for this really fun topic. I hope you all get engaged. Feel free to provide any comments, questions, experiences you have in the chat. Um, there may be some opportunity for a verbal discussion too, but um, Catherine, give us some background and let, let's let's take this away. Hello, everybody. Um, today's toolbox talk, we're, we're going to first address um, potential recovery or exposure to attorney fees, which is understandably very important to most of our clients. And um, then we will address how the extent of that potential exposure can be used to encourage settlement or mitigate risk. Uh, we invite you to share in the chat your experience um, to add to the discussion. Um, as many of you know, the American rule in the United States is that each party pays their own attorney fees unless there's a contract or statutory provision that provides entitlement to fees. Um, as for statutes, uh, in construction matters, I regularly see prompt pay statutes and payment bond statutes, um, which can provide entitlement to fees. I've also um, personally used um, recovery of fees for court proceedings compelling uh, the production of public records requested under the California version of the Freedom Information Act, because uh, public records requests are often a good source of information gathering when a dispute involves a public entity. Um, contract fee provisions are, are typically the most method, uh, the most common method I see. Uh, at least 10 states have statutes that provide for the recovery of reciprocal attorney fees if, if the party, if the contract provision is one-sided um, or, or unilateral. So, um, like uh, states like California, and I believe to a certain extent, Florida have case law as well that uphold an award of fees. Um, or if if the uh, fee provision is um, uh, applicable to one cause of action, for example, the performance bond may have a fee provision, but the contract doesn't. So um, there are two cases which we can, um, we'll put the link in the chat that I've seen that have applied the performance bond um, fee provision to the entire action for, for recovery of fees. <clears throat> uh, Metco Services and G. Voss Canyon Construction Inc. Um, so one other um, experience I've had regarding the entitlement fees is the AAA Rule 48, um, which uh, allows the arbitrator to include an award of attorney fees if all the parties have requested such an award. And I've experienced recently where um, if, uh, the arbitrator said, even independent of a statutory or, or a contract fee provision, the, um, for example, the surety put uh, a prayer for attorney fees in its answer, and the arbitrator said that was a sufficient basis by itself to award attorney fees. Um, there's a Missouri case, City of Chesterfield, which I believe is unpublished, but it discusses this rule and um, states specifically that the AAA Rule 48 can be an independent mechanism for fees even without a contract or a statutory fee provision. 
And I think we'll put that in the chat as well. <clears throat> so when we talk about what may be a good tool for insulating risk, um, one of those tools is the offer for judgment. Um, in California, uh, the authority is in Code of Civil Procedure Section 998. Um, it's commonly referred to as a 998. And one of my colleagues at work appropriately it says it's a, uh, a 998 can turn a loss into a win and a win into a disaster. So I think Mark's going to talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Good morning, everybody. I, I do want to pick up where I think mean, Rule 48 discussion that Catherine said a little bit there, just because uh, Catherine and I were co-counsel on that case. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I guess my takeaway from that case, I represented the surety. We did, um, in my opinion, quite well at trial in terms of you know the the, the claim was um, that Catherine and I defended against was at least over half based on a delay claim. We completely defeated that claim, um, but because we had agreed to uh, under the arbitrator's interpretation by requesting attorney's fees in our prayer. We had agreed that there was uh, attorney's fees were awardable to the prevailing party. The arbitrators awarded the other side attorney's fees. Um, I guess my only two takeaways on that first, California law is directly contrary at that point. We cited to the arbitrator cases that state that a request for attorney's fees and a prayer does not, does not um, provide a right to the recovery of attorney's fees, but of course, as all of you know, the arbitrator can get the facts law wrong and the law wrong, and still you can't do anything about overturning the decision. So I guess my only takeaway is, is if that's at all an issue, um, you should, my advice would be to make that, you know, raise that issue up front and figure out what the playing field is, because it obviously affects settlement and other other issues going forward. Um, all and right. Mark, Mark, this could be also, I mean, you don't even have to pray for it in, a, in using words. You could just check the box on the demand or yeah. counterclaim for them, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And under the under this approach, at least the arbitrators we had, they would say that's enough to, you know, to make a prevailing party clause, which I don't consider that an agreement, but and certainly not an agreement by the client. But uh, the, the, like I said, those arbitrators ruled in that manner. So um, I guess it's a, from, from my perspective, it's a lesson learned about um, the, you know, the potential impact of the check the box, I guess. Um, all right, on the 998 offers. So I'm going to talk about 998 offers, which um, are 998 when I, that's a term, I'm a California lawyer, as I don't know if Tom said, but I am. And so 998 is used, you know, just generally in California, that actually refers to a code of civil procedure section in California. So I'm going to talk about 998. Um, I think the rules are a lot are very similar to other states and jurisdictions, but mm, the cases I cite are basically what I'm talking about is 998. So first 998 is um, like most offers of judgment, it, it offers it offers a plaintiff or a defendant. Uh, it's an offer by a plaintiff or a defendant. I know some states limit who can make the offers, but in California, either side can make the offer. And I think that the, um, the critical, first critical thing about an offer of judgment is it is just that, it's an offer of judgment. What I mean by that is it's not a settlement offer. So sometimes you'll see cases where parties believe they make a 998 offer or offer of judgment, but they make it phase, phrase the offer in a certain way such that it's not, the court does not have the ability to turn it into a judgment. For example, if I were to sue Tom and say, you know, Tom, um, I'm suing you and uh, I'll, you allow judgment uh, of $2 plus you're gonna write me a, you know, a recommendation letter and a, gee, I'm sorry, I did this to you kind of thing. That's, the court can't convert that to a judgment because he has no authority to do that. Um, that's probably a bad example, but that's just one of the ways where you can have a nine on eight offer not work. Um, but if you have a valid nine on eight offer, um, the one thing to know is that it does not in and of itself create an entitlement to attorney's fees. Um, in order to have an attorney's fees in California, um, even in the presence of a 998 offer, 
you have to have an underlying basis for the attorney's fees, either in a contract or a statute. So in the construction world, um, if it's not in the contract, um, the two typical places where you're gonna see it is under a bond or under a prompt pay statute. Um, those are typically the words of attorney's fees under those as opposed to contract are usually different. Um, so, um, so how the 998 offer works in theory in California without for a situation where they don't have a where you don't have an attorney's fees clause, basically the only shift then is on expert fees and costs. If the um, the party that rejects an offer doesn't do better at trial, then there's an argument that, that they don't get their costs or their expert fees at from the date of the offer. But we're talking about attorney's fees. Um, so how, do, how, does, how does it potentially shift in that regard? So the first thing to be, to be aware of is that a 998 offer, um, a 998 offer by itself that just says, if there is an attorney, if there's a grailing party contract, let's just assume that at issue, and the 998 offer does not specifically exclude the, the cost or attorney's fees, the presumption is, is that the party accepting the offer is entitled to then make a motion for attorney's fees and costs. So you need to consider that, that when you're making an offer where there is a, 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 an attorney's fees clause in a contract or some other statutory basis for attorney's fees, you've got to specify whether your offer includes or excludes attorney's fees. I just made one yesterday, actually, in a case where there is a contract that provides for attorney's fees and I included in that offer an attorney's fees claim. So when you're doing that, that gets into a little bit of a math calculation because what how that works is you're trying to cut the person off as to how much attorney's fees they've incurred through the date of the offer. And what you can do then is if you, um, if the, if the offer is not accepted and the other side doesn't do better, you can argue and case law supports, in fact, I can talk about a case that directly deals with it in a second here, you can support an argument that the attorney's fees um, are cut off and that you can get attorney's fees um, going forward, even if the other side prevails. In other words, if you, your, your offer, let's say you're the plaintiff, uh, the offer is a million dollars. The plaintiff doesn't get a million dollars, but they get nine hundred thousand. So the court could rule that they're the prevailing party, but because they didn't beat the nine eight offer, if you could argue that they only get attorney's fees up to the date of the offer, and that flip side is you should have you get attorney's fees incurred after the date of the offer, um, under the theory that hey. I did all I could to, to settle this case, and um, and the other side should have taken the offer, and therefore I shouldn't be punished, and they shouldn't be rewarded, even though they are the prevailing party, because I can't cut them off for being the prevailing party prior to the offer date because they had nothing to accept. In that regard, I should say that um, that technique only works in terms of a offer under nine nine eight in California. Uh, a, a, um, a court will not consider a, an informal settlement offer as a basis for shifting fees in, in the way I just talked about that you can do under 998. Um, Mark, again, Mark what, what do you think about timing of taking that approach? Is it is it something you do right before trial or or is it something you do in the like, beginning of discovery or, you know, what's what, what are the considerations on the timing of when to to issue that? Yeah, I get I mean, the the, so the short answer is you can, of course, can do it anytime. I, I guess. And I don't know if this is the, the, I don't, I, the answer is I don't have a great answer to that question. It, it is a tactical decision. Um, it, it, I guess, in my view, I think they're more likely to give someone pause. Um, you know, the more that the closer you get to trial and the more people are known about their cases and strengths and weaknesses. But ideally, if you could figure out an offer that makes business and legal sense for you and your client early on, the earlier you make the offer, you know, the potentially the greater benefit you can get, right? So if you can you know, if you're the plaintiff and you can cut off a, some somebody's right to get attorney's fees early in the case and potentially shift your way, um, 
then then you know so much the better i think the problem is though is if you make that offer you're conceding that somehow you're you have liability so and what's and what's the number that your client's going to be comfortable with this agreeing that they're going to pay you know what stage of the case and, and so on but theoretically that the, has the strongest uh, you know potential value if you use it early um so the case i just just for just so you can know i'm not making this stuff up there's the case that basically goes through what i just talked about is it's called Scott v. Blunt, and it's a 20, that's a California Supreme case, it's Supreme Court case, excuse me, 20 Cal 4th, 1103, which in that case, um, it did have, uh, it just went through basically the same fact pattern that I just went through here. Um, the, 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 you know, the contract did have an attorney's fees provision. The offer was not accepted. The 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 plaintiff did prevail but didn't but didn't um, exceed the offer so the court did this fleece the fee splitting as just like as i said the plaintiff got the fees they incurred up to the date of the offer the defendant got its fees after the offer should have been accepted um so i just want to um mention that you know most states have um some kind of offer of judgment provision uh, with there are some exceptions. I think Virginia and Pennsylvania are, are two exceptions. Um, and this is at least in 2022. I don't know things might change um, January 1st, but um, the and then other states may have, you know, uh, offers of judgment provisions, but they may be limited. Um, for example, I think in Maryland, they only have apply to medical mal malpractice cases and um, Illinois eminent domain only. So, um, but um, there's also the, in federal um, cases, the federal rule 68, uh, which is um, similar, but each, each jurisdiction has their own little nuances that uh, everyone should be aware of. Um, arbitration, um, like for example, in California, the 998, you can, uh, use it in arbitration as well. Um, there was a, um, in Michigan, there was a case a couple of years ago, Simcor construction, where um, it was, it wasn't um, used heavily in arbitration. And that case said that it was applicable. Um, it, it revolved around the term verdict that's used in the Michigan statute. And um, I don't know if anyone here practices in Michigan, but um, they, they said that uh, because the court had the last uh, word in um, in response to a motion to confirm or vacate an arbitration award, in um, in 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 that case, the the verdict, um, the judgment that the court would enter constitutes a verdict. So that's how uh, Michigan applied their offer of judgment statute to arbitration. <clears throat> Sorry, Sam Gregory had a question about, you know, have you seen this strategy work? I assume talking about kind of flipping the uh, prevailing party attorney's fee provision where the offer of judgment um, costs do not include attorney's fees. And so I, I think most offer of judgment statutes or rules don't include attorney's fees. They just include costs. Uh, but but Sam, I think the issue here is, you know, the de de determination of who's the prevailing party when the judge or arbitrator makes that decision the offer of judgment moves the needle from zero to wherever that offer of judgment is. Um, Catherine, Mark, is, is that your view? Yeah, I think that's right. So uh, the offer of judgment takes away the, you know, the discussion on the, well, it doesn't take away, I should say, but it makes that determination pretty easy. Um, you know, um, without, without, without the offer of judgment and setting aside, the prevailing party is subject to the, you know, the discretion of the court. And typically in California, in the federal law, it's a plaintiff can be the prevailing party as long as they obtain some significant benefit through the litigation, which doesn't have to necessarily be monetary. Um, you see that a lot in your civil rights type cases where, uh, you know, they may not have gotten too much in the way of a, of a um, uh, you know, monetary judgment, but they did get, I, I just make something up, they've got, you know, they 
you, you made, they made a ruling that you have to give, you know, 15 minute lunch breaks or something or whatever, not 15 minute lunch breaks, but some, some kind of, you know, benefit to the litigation. So, but if you have the nine nine eight offer and it, it's, it's easy to determine, typically pretty easy to determine whether the plaintiff prevailed, in other words, or beat the offer or didn't beat the offer. And that basically establishes a, a bright line test for prevailing party. Um, Pretty, so, easy, pretty, pretty easily. It doesn't take away, I should say, even if the plaintiff, like I said, in the, in, in the Scott case bears this out, if, if, even if the plaintiff doesn't beat the 998 offer, it still may be the, it still may be the prevailing party up until the date of the offer, because if they got, if they've got, if they got a judgment, but just not the judgment in excess of the 998 amount. So with, with uh, in answer to Sam's question, um, the experience I've had is, I mean, you can, in, at least in California, you can include attorney's fees or not um, in the 998. And so uh, in cases, I um, I haven't been involved in a case where they haven't accepted it, but in cases where we don't include attorney's fees, they're generally accepted, uh, the 998s, and then we deal with motion, on motion, the attorney's fees after that. So um so, I mean, they're done. Um, I don't, if, if, I mean, how I read his question, he's saying is um, that there, there's no, you can't include attorney's fees in the offer of judgment. So, um, no. yeah, it's, it's, it's not, um, I guess, as lucrative or as desirable <laughs> without the attorney fees in it, but um, it, it still works. To if you don't include it, then you're inviting the fee application, and you might get big yeah, surprised yeah, by if that. You, yeah, if you've got a yeah, if you've got an attorney's fees clause in the contract, or you have a, a like a, a payment bond case where there's attorney's fees, your offer under nine nine eight, if it doesn't address the attorney's fees issue either way, and say it includes or excludes, the law is that it's presumed that it doesn't. Um, include attorney's fees. And so they got the party accepting the offer can then make a motion for fees and costs. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, if you've got a contract, if you've got a, if you've got a case that involves a, an attorney's fees provision, you, it, it's best practice. Well, just, just know that if you don't address the attorney's fees issue in the 998 offer, you will be addressing it later. Yeah. So, um, and the other side's going to win that argument um, if they accept the offer and there's an attorney's fees clause. The court will, in all likelihood, give them attorney's fees. So, so Mark and Catherine, you you have a case that has prevailing party attorney's fees, statutory or by contract. Uh, now you uh, are heading towards the end of the case. Um, what are some best practices, um, both in court or you can focus on arbitration if you want, um, on how to um, smoothly have the the determination of prevailing party decided and the attorney's fees uh, applications or affidavits submitted and reviewed and adjudicated by by the uh, fact finder? You know, what, what are some best practices there? Um, and so defending, I mean, defending against, too. That's I'm sorry? Lot, you know, I said defending against the, those, too. There's a lot well, to unpack I, I, there. I guess there's, there's, let's start with the first part, which is, um, it, it, and sometimes it's, it's, it, it's not clear when the court is going to make the prevailing party um, determination, which is obviously the starting point. Um, sometimes when you, you know, when it, uh, I've, I've, I've tried cases where the, the judge has, um, in most, uh, I think my most recent, my, the, the majority of my experiences with the judge trials has been that the judge has made a, a prevailing party uh, determination at the time of the determination of the amount of the award. Um, but they don't have to. And um, if they don't, then you can address it. The you, you know you get the opportunity to address it. So um, I guess the the lesson that um, the, the best practice would be to try to get the court to tell you whether they're going to make when they're going when they plan to make the prevailing party um, prevailing party determination. But if they do not. Um, if you're making an oral or a, or a written closing and there is a preferring attorney fees clause in it, I would certainly address the issue um, up front and argue, you know, if you're the plaintiff, why you're the prevailing party. And if you're the defendant, obviously, why the other side is not the prevailing party. A um, little bit tough because you don't know what the court's going to do, right? So you're saying, 
judge, even if you give these guys X, please don't give them attorney's fees because they didn't prevail. Um, and you know, and how you argue that is the, the general rule is that you look at what they asked for in their, in their complaint and you know, what they ended up getting. Um, sometimes that's easy, easier made if you can, um, you know, if you've defeated or got a judge, you know, summary judgment, or you were able to dismiss, obtain a dismissal of at some of the causes of action prior to trial or during trial, uh, maybe through directed verdict or something during trial. Um, but yeah, you need to, you need to evaluate the prevailing party clause, whether that's going to be, you, know, you need, the best practice is try to figure out when it's going to be addressed. And if you don't know, always err on the side of making arguments about it whenever, whenever there's a potential that the judge is going to make a ruling on that issue. So, um, and for, Catherine, you got something to say on that? I was just going to say for arbitration, you know, possibly you try to agree in a CMO, um, yeah. For uh, with the other party and the uh, typically our arbitrators will sign off on it so that they're on the same page um, or everyone's on the same page about what's when are you going to argue about fees when are you you know uh, is the arbitrator going to make that prevailing party determination in, in an interim decision or or you know afterwards um, otherwise you know if, if you just make the assumption it's going to be done afterwards you might have it done um, up front before you can argue about it. Yeah, in arbitration, it's much easier to get, you know, figure out, get that ruling up front. And judges sometimes just kind of do their own thing. But yeah, arbitration, it's definitely a good idea to direct, figure out what the, the playing field is, so to speak. So um, the next part is, you know, how do you get your fees? And, and, and typically, if you're getting your attorney's fees, you're always get, also getting your expert fees um, because clauses generally have both. So um you know the good news is that both federal law and california law the presumption is is that the fees incurred by the prevailing party are reasonable and are recoverable um so that makes it easy um the other way you know the best practice for getting attorney's fees it is to uh, uh, consider that up front when you first start the case um, and, you know, be as, as we all hate to do, be as specific as, as you can in your billings as to what you're looking for at and, you know, what area you're legal, you're researching, not just doing legal research on, you know, whatever, but be as specific as possible. And so, I kind of think of it like uh, when you're arguing about whether a work a, a client has done is change order work or contract work, and sometimes those blend together because you know they're not wearing a different color hat or vest if they're doing change order work. And so, same thing happens here. And of course, that's a a bigger problem if in the legal world if you're running into a situation where the other side did prevail, but you know they. They didn't prevail on certain causes of action, and so um, they shouldn't get attorney's fees, arguably, for that cause of action. Or, you know, that, that's one of the examples that comes to mind. Like I talked about in the case where we were able to defeat the delay claims. You know, there's you could argue about those types of things, um, but the best practice is to is to be as you know specific as possible in your billings. Frankly, in cases where I haven't done that, and I have to, and I, and I, and there has been situations where, you know, um, I've taken some actions, even though, even where I'm, even in situations where I'm the prevailing party, and, you know, I've cut out things on purpose with just to save the argument. For example, if, if you would have brought a summary judgment motion or a directed verdict and you lost it, consider whether you should include that time or whether there's, you know, um, you should subscribe to the pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered theory, and maybe not ask for everything. So there's there's some some you know if you know for sure the other side's I kind of evaluate if I know for sure the other side's going to have somewhat of a, of a good argument on why some costs could be excluded, maybe you know maybe take those off as you go. Um, but um, the other thing to think about is you know when you make your cost applet your fee application um why it is if you're if you're asking for a certain fee um you know in california you, you you're going probably elsewhere you've got to you've got to judge 
that um, is handling all types of cases, some TIs, some slip and fall, some you know, insurance defense type things. And so they may see a rate of a construction lawyer and thinks it's high. So you, you need to, you know, the law is generally that, generally in California and I think elsewhere that the reasonable fee is based on the type of work and charged by similar practitioners in that area and the, in the relevant geographic area. So you want to supply your, um, you know, provide your, your, your moving papers for the motion with evidence to support your, obviously support the reasonableness of your, of your rate. Um, and that's really the takeaways. I guess, I guess the other thing I just, just so I, I've talked about it is situations where, um, you know, if you're the plaintiff and you haven't prevailed on all causes of action, um, the thing which you're going to, which, you know, the defendant will try to defeat on the basis that you didn't win on everything. The case law supports a comeback by saying that the, the, the losing actions um, and the work done on the losing actions was inextricably intertwined is the, the buzzword phrase to say with the, with the claims you did prevail on. So you obviously want it, you want to make those arguments if you're the plaintiff and the flip side, if you're the defendant. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, I would say that some jurisdictions are outliers. Rhode Island had a Supreme Court case recently that said you need ex attorney expert affidavit, a third party to testify as to the reasonableness of, mm. of the fees, which was kind of interesting. Uh, Catherine, I'll give you the final word. Thank you, Mark, very much. Ex excellent Thank job. You. Catherine? So just, uh, as a parting word, I would just, uh, I think most of us um, do that, you know, attorney memo uh, on a fee entitlement and just because the cases take, uh, that we deal with take kind of a long time that you need to go back to, I would suggest to go back to that memo and update it if necessary. Um, have open communication with your client about attorney fees. Um, uh, potential exposure, potential recovery um, throughout the case, um, not just at the beginning or at the end. <laughs> great. Thank you, everyone. Have a great, have a great day. Thanks, Bye. guys. Thank you.